Hello and welcome back to this course on labor and decent work in supply chains. Now, one of the terms that you will come across when you read about the emergence of global supply chains is flexible specialization. This is a term that is used to describe a range of strategies that emerged especially in Japan and Southeast Asia to modify the prevalent model of mass production by workers repeatedly performing the same tasks on a single production line. The term Fordism, which refers to the automobile manufacturing strategies of Henry Ford, is used to describe these older strategies. Now, instead of a single production line, these new strategies used long-term supply and subcontracting networks. They employed a core of workers who had a variety of skills and so could perform a variety of tasks, and a periphery of workers who had fewer skills and so would perform fewer tasks repeatedly. These flexibly specialized supply chains were therefore less standardized, could respond quicker to changes in demand, and also supply specialized goods. The value chain for manufacturing textiles in India, both for export and for the Indian market, contain an extensive network of cotton producing farms, processing units, cloth production units, and garment manufacturing units of several different sizes. Alongside large export companies, thousands of smaller workshops employ a constantly changing number of workers through labor contractors to produce smaller batches of garments. I think um, if we're looking at the global um, supply chain, um, India is um, one of the largest um, uh, exporters, uh, not the largest. Uh, there are others such as Bangladesh um, and China. Um, but we, um, we find that India has um, quite a developed uh, garment industry and has for uh, the past sort of recent decades been, been playing quite an important role within uh, global value chains, primarily in terms of uh, cotton uh, being such a large um, producer and also exporter of, of, of cotton um, and um, we find in terms of uh, across the country uh, in terms of the global value chains or global commodity chains if we want to call them that um, Delhi NCR area uh, Bangalore and Tirupur are three of the key hubs and we also find production um, in other areas um, in, in the country including uh, different parts of North India uh, and and um, other areas of Tamil Nadu and and so on. Yeah, you see, sir, Tamil Nadu, the registered uh, textile industry, uh, particularly spinning, dyeing, and garment processing unit, and uh, knitting. Uh, these are all the factories industries involving textile production supply chain. The registered factory uh, seven thousand four hundred and one three. This is a textile registered factories. Uh, therefore, in India, all over national wide, 60% uh, exporters uh, from Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu, particularly Western Tamil Nadu. That's Erode, Tirupur, Coimbatore, uh, and, also, uh, and also this uh, Namakkal, Dindukal, Karur, and Salem. This is a seven district uh, textile hub, even though the, some other uh, factories in uh, garment industry from Chennai also there. But majority their textile hub is Western Tamil Nadu. The 60% production they are doing export to Europe and US and UK and other countries. Even uh, not only their uh, export uh, garment uh, uh, production, uh, fabric item, and also they are exporting yarn item also. Yarn item also from the spinning they are sending to uh, exporting. Therefore, the yarn and also uh, garment item, the two things. They are 60% from uh, uh, this region, western region, exporting to other country. Uh, we did a study um, as uh, Tradecraft uh, last year um, in uh, focusing on Delhi and CR area. And we identified, uh, for the purposes of what was a small exploratory study, three broad uh, categories of workspace, uh, export-oriented factories, uh, informal um, uh, factories and production units and and also home working uh, and um, even within these three categories there's a lot of 
uh, variety or and, and, and diversity. Um, so uh, it, it 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 is um, a, um, a very kind of a complex kind of uh, thing that we're trying to describe, um, and you know that would be at, at the global uh, side. But obviously, when we, when we start talking about domestic size of the value chains, uh, um, things also get uh, complex. And there's a, there's also a sense of fluidity in that you might have workers, for example, uh, such as home workers or others, uh, who are at once perhaps one week working um, on on uh, for, for a product for a global brand and then uh, in the future or in the past perhaps may also be taking on um, some work that might be feeding into the domestic markets um, and uh, um, the so in, in, in that sense there is a sort of overlap or there can be at times between uh, especially at the more informal ends there may be an overlap between between global and, and, and domestic I think at the more formal levels um, it becomes clearer uh, you know as to which is uh, you know which is global and, and, and which is domestic because the nearer you get to the lead buyer um, or the or the brand uh, the purchaser uh, obviously the more uh, regulations and so on have to be uh, uh, typically uh, at least in theory have to be uh, brought in um, and, and and the character of the kind of workplace um, changes as it, as that integration uh, with the global chains uh, becomes more um, uh, sort of close in that sense. Thus we can observe a great variety of firms of different sizes that are manufacturing textiles in India. Some of them participate in global supply chains supplying cotton, yarn and garments. We can observe a similar variety in the farms and processing units that are part of the supply chain for sugar in India. Yeah, in, in Uttar Pradesh is the biggest uh, sugar producing state of the India and it produced minimum 40 to 50 percent of the sugar of the India and most of the sugar belt uh, is situated in the foothills of the Himalaya and western Uttar Pradesh. And uh, in one district in Lakhimpur Khiri, more than 130 sugar mills are situated. In Mujaffarnagar and Merat also, there are many, one district, 12, Merat, there, there will be 12 sugar mills, and also in Mujaffarnagar, there are 15 sugar mills. So these are the sugar mills situated in the different part of the state also. But uh, most of the area are the sugar belt, it's called sugar belt, where the sugar cane farmer are growing sugars and uh, it state level all the rates decided by the government of uh, Uttar Pradesh. They have a uh, different department, it called the sugar department, Ganna, Ganna it Hindi called the Chini, Chini Udiyog or Ganna and Ganna department, Ganna production department. So these department have a right to decide the minimum support price for the sugar, uh, sugar cane. And uh, they, as per the law, in 15 kilometer radius, only one sugar mill should be there. After 15 kilometers, there is other sugar mills maybe. But the, this is also decided by the government of Uttar Pradesh so that the sugar can supply chain will be maintained. And in 15 kilometers radius, one sugar mill situated where the farmers produce sugar. Sugar mills also supply some seeds, also sometimes. Um, fertilizers as a loan, as a credit of the sugar cane farmers and after the decision make every year the, by the government of UP, minimum support price, the sugar mills have established a one um, procurement center in each village or maybe the three village in one sugar um, purchasing center in three village or some village also uh, as per some of the village are very good sugar cane producing villages. There are one village may have three sugar uh, procurement centers, sugar cane procurement center. Some one village have also two sugar cane procurement center. It depends upon the situation and production of the sugar cane. And particular area decided by the government of Uttar Pradesh, which area is the catchment area of the particular sugar mill. Sugar cane farmers growing the sugar cane and uh, each year government decided the sugar cane minimum price after that, uh, sugar cane mill established a sugar cane purchasing center in the village. The farmers produce sugar and also give the sugar cane to the procurement center. And from there, the sugar mill also um, collected the, all the sugar cane and uh, supplied to the sugar mill. 
and for the payment uh, after the 15 days or 10 days some sugar mill also pay, uh, do the payment to the farmers and farmers have also right to uh, receive the interest as per the high court and supreme court order if sugar mill are not able to pay within 14 days the sugar mill have to give the interest uh, to the sugarcane farmers but this is not happening this is a very big challenge and as per the record by the government of UP, there are some more than 14,000 crores rupees are due upon the sugar mill and they are not paying to the sugarcane farmers. As per the sugarcane policy, the sugarcane sugar can policy, sugar mill should pay the, all the due within 14 days to the farmers. This is one very big aspect we are existing. Other thing, as per sugar supply chain, the farmer supply the sugar cane to the mill, then sugar mill um, process the sugar cane juice and also produce the sugar and then they also supply the same sugar to the uh, government of India also to distribute under the food corporation of India and under the public distribution system. And also the some um, big company industry, biscuit industry, chocolate industry, toffee industry also procure sugar from the sugar mills. It may be the Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola are the biggest buyer of the sugar in the UP, and also some toffee making um, factories and also the companies also buying the sugar from the um, sugar uh, mills. And same way, the uh, government of India also decide the quota to export the sugar from the sugar mill to the um, abroad. So they also the sugar mill so, uh, selling the sugar to the Gulf countries, also the Thailand, also sometime in Japan, also the United Kingdom, so many where they are selling the sugar. The agriculture sector uh, employ around uh, 3 crores of the people, including the farmers and also the agriculture workers. So 30 million people are also involved and engaged in the sugar um, can production se sector. And in this area, 50% uh, are the sugar can agriculture worker, labor, and 50% are the farmers. And the farmers also comprise the different levels. Some are the very marginal farmers, which who have one to five acres of the land. Some are the middle farmers who have five to 10 to 15 acres of the land. And some are the bigger, biggest big farmer who have 15 to 30 to 50, 100 acres of the land. They are producing and they are producing the sugar cane. In processing, sometimes also the sugar cane production are very high and the procurement capacity of the sugar mill are very low. So if the farmers producing, for example, one, one lakh ton, metric ton sugar, the sugar mill will only buy 50% and 50% also goes to the some small jaggery making units or some brown sugar making units. So in that way, if you see this, one sugar uh, mill have a minimum 5,000 workers, which are a very average number. Some have a 3,000, some have a 7,000, some have a 8,000. That's big sugar, sugar mill. And a small units have a minimum 50 to 100 persons working with the small units of the sugar mills. Yeah, it depends upon the seasonality. Seasonality is a very important thing here. In February to March, April, they are also sowing, sowing the sugar, um, sugar cane in the field. And in some part of the state also in October to December also they are sowing. And this is the one type of the work. After the, when the sugar cane uh, ready for the um, cutting and harvesting, then they have to harvest it, cut it, then also the clean it. And uh, also they are making the bundles and uh, loading and uploading of the tractors and also the trucks and also the wake, small wake bullock cart there and then supplying to the sugar cane purchasing center it's called procurement center at the sometime in five village one sometime also one in each village sometime two in each one village so that type of the also work they are doing and after that when the trucks loaded uh, from the center then the truck uh, goes to the sugar mill and in sugar mill also there are some unorganized workers or contract workers who are also um, doing some work for the um, uh, clear the loads from the trucks and also send, uh, send it to the sugar um, unit gate. 
So this, this type of the things they are working in the from the farm to mill. In the mill also they are doing the the boiling the sugar cane juice and after the boiling there are so many processes, liquid, semi liquid and then solid. And uh, after that, uh, there are some mechanized system there. And when the sugar uh, ready from there, then then have to also the packing, and uh, workers or the laborers are also the um, sometime loading, sometime sometime doing some other thing, counting and also the spreading on the ground. And the sugar cane industry also there are so many flues are affected that area, so they are also doing some sanitization with the phenyl and other chemicals to check the flavage um, and flies. And in that way they are doing on different type of thing but most of the work are the seasonal. In from, uh, from October to May there are harvesting time. From May to June there are also some doing some um, irrigation and also doing some weeding, de-weeding, supplying the fertilizer. These are the things are because sugar cane also for the one year crop. This is not seasonal crop. So one year there are some work in the sugar cane, some time different type of the work they are doing. In the first module of this course, you were introduced to global supply chains and the common challenges that arise for labor and human rights in these chains. In this module, you will learn more about these challenges through the supply chains in India for sugar and for garments. As we have already seen, the agricultural production of sugarcane and cotton requires a lot of labour. This demand for labour, however, is of a seasonal nature and is offset by the peculiar vulnerabilities of the people who are seeking work. Many researchers have documented this characteristic of supply chains. They take advantage of economic and social disadvantages of the workers to produce goods cheaper. So uh, again, and, and when we look at uh, uh, agricultural labor force in India, uh, some of the crops are uh, uh, um, are particularly uh, labor intensive, uh, and you know uh, an example of uh, these crops would be uh, something like sugarcane, which is an extremely labor intensive crop both for the sowing and the harvesting season. Uh, and similarly, uh, cotton, which is the primary uh, source material for the textile sector, where uh, where both the the sewing of the cotton, the 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 intercultural kind of uh, uh, preparatory activities, and uh, the cotton picking, which is one of the most important uh, or most uh, labor intensive uh, uh, activity. So far, uh, you know, there have been attempts at mechanization. Uh, both for sugar harvesting as well as cotton picking, but they have not yet been very successful and it remains to be an extremely labor intensive uh, activity. Uh, now what happens often is that in these peak uh, agricultural season, be it a sugar harvesting season or a cotton picking season, the availability of local labor is insufficient uh, for the labor requirement for uh, you know the industrial scale at which this uh, the sugar cane production or the cotton production happens in India. So often it's also the uh, the main crops which leads to uh, a very large uh, which, which sees a very large number of migrant laborers uh, coming from labor surplus states in India like Bihar, Jharkhand, and certain parts of Madhya Pradesh. Orissa traveling, uh, you know, migrating to uh, the the uh, the production centers like uh, be it Punjab, be it Gujarat, be it Maharashtra, be it uh, Telangana, which are the major producing hubs of of these crops, uh, and uh, and engage or and kind of uh, the farmers there uh, engage this labor force uh, and. Often when the migrant laborer uh, are migrating on, on a seasonal basis, they migrate with their family. So it's the husband, wife with their kids migrating out overall as a family. They live in the, uh, uh, in the farms where they are working uh, in kind of uh, some kind of a makeshift tent or a, you know, tarpaulin or under a tarpaulin seat or something like that under extremely poor conditions, which would also mean that the kids 
are out of school or uh, you know, sometimes it, it you know that the agricultural season also merges with the uh, the vacation time on the school uh, you know uh, that would be uh, uh, you know at that time they miss school that's, that's not a problem but often also these agricultural activities you know uh, pan into uh, especially if we're talking about the kharif uh, season and the harvesting of the kharif season these are happening around the school year so the kids obviously miss their school and there isn't uh, adequate opportunity for them to go to a school in the destination location where where their parents are working so it leads to it, it leads to kind of school dropouts uh, cases for the kids and often when kids are available who are out of school even kids as as young as 8 9 10 years old often end up helping out their parents in the farm in the labor work itself not necessarily earning an wage but because the wage of their parents is pegged to certain amount of output that needs to be produced uh, whether it is cotton picking or it is uh, you know uh, cane cutting in the case of sugar cane often the kids are actually uh, and helping out in order to make sure that their parents are able to meet those very very stiff target to be able to earn their wages and that actually leads to a very a large risk of child labor engagement in agriculture and that's how child labor in agriculture uh, really uh, 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 one of the major contributor to child labor engagement in agriculture comes from these two uh, crops. Most of the sugar uh, cane farming system, the sowing and harvesting done by the agriculture laborer, who are the, most of them are the belong to the scheduled caste and OBC community. And if we, if we uh, uh, examine their percentage, it may be the 50% of the sugar cane farmers are uh, OBC, to 30%, 20 to 30% are the scheduled caste, it may be the Dalits. Tribal population are very low in Uttar Pradesh, so there are no tribal population countable here. And on the same way, if they see their, their uh, nature of the, from, from where they are coming. For the harvesting time also in Merit and Mujaffar Nagar or Western Uttar Pradesh, local labor are working in Delhi market, so they are not doing work in the, their own farm, own village. So from that villages, the uh, sugarcane um, workers are coming from different part of the state, particularly from Bihar, from Jharkhand, and from Eastern Uttar Pradesh. From here they are going to the Merit and Mujaffar Nagar and other western part of the Uttar Pradesh. And in the Tarai foothills of the Himalaya, the local farmers are work, local sugarcane uh, uh, agriculture workers are working there. And their composition is also the same. Forty percent may be the OBC, other backward caste. 30% around the Dalits and some few negligible percentage are from the Nepalese because some of the district of the UP which are the sugar cane growing district they are situated in the border of the Nepal uh, for example Lakhimpur Khiri, Bijnaur, no, not Bijnaur, Lakhimpur Khiri, Udham Singh Nagar, Bahraich, Sarvasti, Balrampur, Gonda these are the district at the border of the Nepal so sometime harvesting time the whole family migrated from Nepal to India and they are doing the um, harvesting in the sugar um, cane farming and they did it. But their also percentage are not countable and in that area 20% uh, laborer are from migrants from different part of the state or different part of the country and 60% uh, um, are the local. And uh, other rest 20% are some floating, sometime here, sometime there, they are the migrants, similar migrants they are working and doing. Or there are some also the farmers who have a small marginal farmers, one acre of the land, half acre of the land. So they are doing also some farming in their own land and also doing some um, job work and daily wage work. In the first module of this course, you learnt about the central role that labour law plays in making work more humane and the role of collective action in advocating for decent work. Now imagine a market for labour where there is neither any labour law nor any collective action. This would mean that there are neither any minimum standards that the employment relationship and the terms of work must meet, nor any trade union to bargain collectively on behalf of the workers. This nightmare scenario is almost entirely true of the market for labour in Indian agriculture except for some overarching laws such as the minimum wages law 
there are few standards applicable to the employment relationship in Indian agriculture. In the absence of law and collective bargaining, employment relationships in agriculture mirror the lopsided nature of Indian society. Land ownership is concentrated among certain classes and workers almost entirely belong to socially disadvantaged sections. The, um, uh, if you see the uh, community wise, the most of the farmers in the whole area, they belong to the uh, upper caste, are called the general community, general caste. And if you see the caste wise, they are the Jat, Gujar, uh, Brahmin, Chatriya. They are the owner or sometimes of the OBC also. Some OBC dominant community are also very strong in some area. Maybe there are Gujar, they are the Kurmi and there are the Yadav and who are doing the, um, producing the sugar cane. In some area, some uh, uh, Sikh farmers from the Punjab also they owning the big farms, particularly in the foothills area, Tarai area, like in Purkiri, Sarvasti and Baharaj. So during the independent and after, during the division, a lot of the farmers migrated from the Pakistan, they sold their own land there and they also government of India also um, um, allotted some land in that Tarai area, foothills of the Himalaya area. So they belong to the Sikh community, they, they are the Punjabi farmers. So they are the farmers who are doing, if you see in the percentage, the OBC farmers may be the 50 percent, 20 to 25 percent are the general community farmers and uh, 20 percent may be the um, very Dalit or um, most, most backward community who have uh, purchased very small piece of the land, maybe they one acre, two acre, one acre to five acres. Now, uh, one of the uh, most unfortunate part of labor, uh, labor scenario in agriculture sector is the fact that it is primarily an unregulated space. There hasn't been uh, 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 there hasn't been proper regulatory mechanism uh, established or applied uh, or you know, implemented in the agricultural scenario and then hence the uh, uh, the uh, the working conditions wages or any of the uh, any of the parameters that you really analyze when you are thinking about a labor force and labor participation uh, is very much uh, left to the uh, the the free will of the market, so to say, based on you know uh, demand and supply, and hence uh, uh, because the land holding in India have historically been uh, quite uh, concentrated among the landed class. Uh, uh, often the caste system played a uh, uh, played a role there, and you know there are spe specific castes in India that are known as the landowning caste, like the Jats, for example, or Bhumihars in Bihar and the Godas in in Karnataka and things like that. Uh, and then uh, uh, basically, you know, so the, the the land ownership was concentrated among few people, and and the uh, rest of the people either had very very small parcel of land to cultivate for their own consumption, or had surplus labor availability and 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 and, and, and were, were kind of going in for labor work in these large landlords uh, uh, fields uh, and hence again i think the the uh, the negotiating power or bargaining power when it came to uh, various parameters of either working conditions various social benefits or wages negotiation all of this were very lopsided with the land owners uh, having a much larger say or bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the labor force. Here everything is informal, not written. It is verbal. So for example, if a 10 group of the agriculture worker goes to the farmer that we want to work in your farm and the farmers may be also requested them to come to the farm and work there, there is no written agreement with them. So if the particular workers goes to the trade union office to form a union, they are ask that to please give the um, proof of the, your work. So they are unable to give the work because farmers will never give the uh, any contract with them. So that's why there is no relations. Both both side there is a problem, the supply side and demand side. So there is no demand also because this is very scattered, very weak, very illiterate. 
and in the bargaining capacity they are very low because if they are not working in that area and the farmers are very united, they are strong, they are educated, they have a good connection with their system. So the farmers are very strong position and the workers are very weak positions. Different with the cost wise and also economic status, social status, cultural status, they are migrants or legal system also not supporting them. So these are the main reasons. They, because they are, if you see the visually, these are very visible the relations, employee and employee relation. But if you ask for the paper, there is no written agreement with them, no written contract with them. This imbalance in negotiating power increases the risk for some severe violations of human rights, including child labor and trafficking. Specifically in cotton, there is another major area which leads to kind of labor exploitation and specifically child labor exploitation. And this is in the context of the cotton seed production specifically for the new uh, BT or GMO cotton varieties. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, the GMO cotton really, uh, you know, uh, the pollination in the GMO cotton it doesn't occur in a natural uh, setting. So, uh, you know, large multi multinational seed companies often have contracted uh, seed producing farmers who, uh, who are provided the, 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 the basic material, they grow uh, those, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the, the foundation crop or, or the, uh, you know, the, the, for, the, for the seed pr production purpose, they grow the cotton on their field and the pollination has to be done manually through artificial process and uh, you know uh, often the pollination uh, in this bt cotton uh, activities are, uh, are are most productive when it is done before dawn that would mean that you know the labor force have to wake up at you know 3 34 in the morning and then work in the field before the sunrise to make sure that they are kind of uh, uh, physically, you know, connecting the the male and the female plant for the for the pollination purpose, and again, I you know uh, the the socio-economic reality of this is that you know, uh, for example, you know, Gujarat, both uh, you know, a lot of this North Gujarat districts are major hubs of cotton seed production for uh, for the GMO or the BT seeds, and. Uh, often they don't find local labor force willing to take on that kind of hardship at low cost. So often it is migrant labor, typically the tribal communities in the neighboring Rajasthan, the, the Bhil, Bhilwada or some of these districts uh, you know, where tribal communities are there. And again, I think there is a myth propagated that uh, if this pollination activity is conducted by uh, a, a teenage girl, uh, or teenage unmarried girl, the, the productivity would, would be highest, uh, which is just an excuse in a way to then uh, uh, to uh, to traffic, uh, you know, girl of the poverty age from their villages, tribal villages in Rajasthan, come in groups, live in the fields here in uh, in, in a state like Gujarat where the cotton production hubs are there, work. Uh, you know, f from something like morning 3.30 or 4, uh, you know, till uh, 8 or 9 and doing this pollination exercise uh, during during that particular season, uh, which again, and, and it, it, it has created its own kind of uh, business ecosystem in, in the sense that then there are labor contractors who, who work for these uh, landed uh, large farmers or contracted labor. Uh, contracted farmers by of the MNCs in the cotton seed production space who uh, really uh, you know bring uh, who take contract for bringing in these uh, girls or small boys from tribal communities uh, to come in and work on on the pollination uh, work uh, in in the cotton seed production and uh, often you know all the other associated vices around this of child trafficking around child sexual abuse a whole lot of other vices happen because of this because these are all uh, small kids uh, in their uh, you know in the age of puberty who are being trafficked who are staying in an alien location uh, without any parental or family supervision uh, in kind of makeshift tents under the and their entire kind of 
freedom of movement, freedom of uh, uh, you know being access to any kind of services is controlled by this labor contractor or the large farmer for whom they are working. So a whole uh, ecosystem of you know a number of associated abuse uh, kind of uh, comes about because of this practice uh, which is put over there. Farm also there are some big farms where the more than 100 acres of the land are available and big farmers are doing the farming. That area also, the, if the farmers want the laborer or the agriculture worker from a particular area, that farmer contact to the uh, local contractor, local middle person. And that middleman also may be the part of that same community. So that middle person also motivate the 100, far, 100 workers and uh, bring to the farm and they have to start the work. And this is totally informally. And the far, uh, workers are very weak. They are not asked that to give us a written contract. They just uh, for, the, for their uh, accounting purpose. They just written the name. That yeah, particularly, for example, name is A, B, C. A, B, C, the attendance may be the one day, two days, three days, 30 days. For attendance and payment, they prepare some record. But for the agreement and for the contract, for the MO, there is no record there. So that's why we can't find the, any employee-employer relations there. Particularly, the uh, most of the contractors are also belongs to the same community. And maybe the that community has the labor? Yeah. Maybe that, that same contractor worked 10 years ago in the same farm. And the farmers also asked the same contractor to bring some more, more laborer and from their own native villages. And that uh, contractor went to village and also come with the 100 workers or 50 workers with the same farm. And they started the working. That contractor may be the... Now the economic standard may be the uh, good in comparison to the debt workers and because they also have to take some commission. Sometimes they also take some advances from the big farmers. For example, uh, sometimes they also pay the 50,000 to the contractor to bring some 100 farm laborer to the sugarcane farmer. And sometime also they are coming after they are fulfilling the work, they also um, receive the money from the farmers. And that there are there is no direct relation between the contractor, no no direct relation between the farmer and the workers. There are some middle middle person of the contractor, and that contractor are the working as agent of the farmers in that area, and uh, that contractor also convincing the workers for sometimes the extra work. For example, if they have targeted that they they have to harvest two acres of the land sugarcane farm one one day. Maybe their working hours increased. It may be the from six hours to eight hours to the ten hours to twelve hours, and the contractor also convinced the um, workers, hey, please do it, please complete the work, do it, and today evening they will give the some good food, maybe some good party, and this type of the things going on there. So far, we have learned how the agricultural production of cotton and sugarcane benefits from the vulnerabilities of workers. Farms employ migrant and unorganized workers under non-standard terms of employment through networks of contractors. Some of these features can also be observed in other parts of the supply chain. For example, firms that manufacture yarn and textiles employ women and migrant workers who previously had difficulties accessing this type of work. But quite similar to workers in agriculture, many workers even higher up the value chain also do not have the protection of labor law or collective bargaining. You see, in textile supply chain, uh, near um, uh, 15 to 18, 15 to 18 years, uh, there are several studies said 40% uh, nearby 40% are uh, 15 to 18 years uh, workers, young workers, that's what we call young workers. Though they are not uh, as an uh, adult worker, they are young worker, adults and worker. Uh, as per uh, UNCRC, uh, United Nations Child Aids Convention 1989, we should accept that they are also children. Uh, therefore, they are involving in the textile supply chain, uh, they are also child labor. They are also child labor. Uh, because even though this uh, factory act said uh, 15 to 18, they can work. 
uh, but uh, as per act factory act uh, uh, they said uh, they should get a fit certificate from a health department uh, fit certificate they should work only uh, morning time only 4 hours 4 hours so it is not they are following even though factory act they are considering as adult worker they involving three shift morning half night full night also so so that is that is as per child rights activist we should not accept uh, this kind of things here even we demanding with the uh, uh, brands uh, even we demanding with the government even right to education act that's also they said uh, 14 still the uh, 14 children means 14 it should be changed change uh, still 18 are children that is our our stand sir yeah it's different in different parts of the country so i think in in ncr for example uh, it's largely male uh, in the factory settings um and um uh, but but as you go lower as it were down the supply chain and certainly you know among the home workers you find uh that they're all women pretty much um uh bangalore is more female uh and there're also more uh, women um in um in tirupur larger number of women um in in tirupur area than certainly than in um, in in delhi um we also find divisions in terms of the nature of work that they that they are undertaking so um uh what we under have understood is that women for example um will be less likely to hold senior management positions even where women say in bangalore are actually uh in large numbers within on the factory floor they're less likely to hold those supervisor positions which in turn kind of then makes them at greater risk of of the kind of sexual harassment that we were just referring to um uh women are also more likely we understand to face uh uh kind of exclusion from the workplace at times of economic constraint when for example uh production is is low um uh they they are the more ones who are more likely to be uh uh you know uh kind of find themselves not recalled back into the factories uh and and you know we've heard that from a couple of women we spoke to in southwest delhi um and i think that's part of a broader that may be part of a broader um picture um so um so yeah so broadly i think um women occupying uh less senior roles and 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 different levels of um even within say the the factory settings and then different uh uh kind of spaces of the supply chain that they are finding themselves in in fact we found that um in informal production units in in delhi or these informal factories that may be kind of fewer than 10 or more than 10 but kind of they're sort of workshops or karkhanas as they may be called uh locally no more than say around 30 workers that women were not so common in these spaces and we weren't really sure why but it might be partly also to do with uh um sexual harassment and the risk thereof and uh and and clearly perhaps then a, a lack of uh, uh grievance uh, mechanisms um that they have uh, and um you know one area we were looking at various areas around um occupational health and safety uh access to um Uh, kind of collective voice uh wages and peace rates and so on um and uh what we you know why why are we working with with home workers is because they are in terms of these uh some of these labor areas that we are kind of talking about here they're the least uh entitled of all uh because they uh are located outside of the purview of the regulations uh that and and of the laws that actually have been set up for the more formal workers be it the factories act for example or others uh they don't have access to social security um i- entitlements uh typically uh they're not part of unions in most cases although organizations like these are like save and and so on and so on are you know involved in that work of trying to support them to organize um so in terms of the gaps we have to um uh kind of take 
full cognizance of the scale of informality in India and and you know recognize obviously that 90 percent I think it is something like that of the workforce is informal so if they're informal even when we're talking about these laws that are there um, you know they're not applying to these to these uh, levels uh, and um, uh, the the um, you know in that sense um, any one of these labor standards that we actually talk about uh, uh, whether it's health and safety uh, whether it's um, uh, wages uh, whether it's um, you know the right to uh, unionize or collective bargaining and so on uh, you know they're not really kind of um, applying to many to many home workers uh, gender uh, nowadays uh, 80% are uh, 80 to 90% are women only uh, women only uh, because you see is a shift to the even uh, 90s after 90s the globalization happened in world level in india also it is affecting uh, after 90s slowly uh, their suppliers suppliers uh, they are giving a voluntary retirement to permanent workers permanent workers they slowly they are recruiting women only women only but always when we are seeing uh, my own experience in the in the tamil nadu uh, even before i coming to uh, this uh, civil society uh, i know because uh, here we are living here nearby textile industry mostly men they are working in the uh, textile supply chain spinning and garment but uh, only in the uh, reeling and cone winding and tailoring some department only women we can see very few but nowadays 80 to 90% are women women it, it is shifting uh, from uh, 90s 90s slowly they are uh, uh, giving voluntary retirement vrs to permanent worker they slowly they are recruiting women only uh, because in the name of culture in the, in the name of uh, uh, religion uh, always there uh, is a caste caste and uh, gender patriarchal they are using as uh, their their business positive positive that's we we are seeing uh, seeing uh, they, therefore nowadays we can see uh, 80 to 90% are women women they are believing uh, the believing suppliers believing believe oh women they will not take uh, leaves uh, they will uh, they can work uh, contribute more they don't have uh, taking any smoke or going for outside the factory during their work uh, so therefore they are uh, always the domination by the men uh, so therefore they are uh, recruiting only mostly women uh, this is 80 to 90 percent uh, even the all the supervisor level uh, supervisor level are uh, all are the men only uh, men only uh, men only in this situation we can see here this caste and gender they playing uh, very uh, big role big role in the business uh, textile supply chain mm, because you see uh, before uh, 60s even 70s uh, only so called upper caste people they working in the textile supply chain a working means he is a laborer even the worker uh, because dalits they are untouchable people they are not recruited they are recruited the slowly after 70s uh, even 80s uh, they changing uh, shift uh, they are recruiting slowly dalits because they so called upper caste uh, 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 community they 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 dropped their child labor reduced child labor reduced they went for higher education uh, therefore there is no child labor workforce uh, even though they went for other work starting business something their only ideal ideal workforce is dalits they compromised themselves uh, in the name of profit they recruited slowly as a dalits now we can see now we can see uh, 60 to 70% near dalits only in the textile supply chain uh, textile supply chain therefore we can see this caste and gender is they playing a big role in textile business supply chain uh, even though uh, workers are uh, workers are dalit community but this management level management level mostly so called upper caste men only they are having therefore always they are looking uh, in the workers on the workers uh, these are all dalits uh, therefore they can do anything as a supervisor uh, as per hr uh, even factory manager uh, even manager they can do anything on the workers because of this mindset coming from because of these are dalits uh, dalit worker they can do anything that's why this harassment harassment even sexual abuse or verbal abuse 
even uh, forced labor and happening on this worker uh, even the, uh, why they selecting uh, supervisors their own community they believing the purity and something uh, only their, their community can do all all those things that's why even uh, top level even supervisor level management level they recruiting only their own caste this this workers mostly they are seventy uh, percent near uh, Dalits only, uh, Dalits only, because they are uh, they are in the nearby village or uh, nearby district, other district, even uh, other state, other state. They coming for this work uh, by this they recruiting by the agent, by the agents, even HR, even their own friends. For example, the co-worker, the co-worker, they going to holiday their own village. They recruiting ten workers, uh, ten workers. Their uh, factory, their factory, they are giving some award for gold coin. In Deepavali or Pongal, uh, two f festivals are very big festivals, famous festival in Tamil Nadu. During that time, uh, who are all some off worker, they are getting uh, leave, they are giving some condition. Okay, you can go to the uh, uh, your own village, but when you are coming back within one week, you have to recruit 10 worker. You, if you recruit 10 worker, we are going to give uh one gold kind small gold kind if you're recruiting uh, our uh, five worker we will give offer five thousand or nearby uh, 60 sorry uh, six thousand something so like that uh, they're recruiting uh, therefore the you see the, the this kind of workers they are all mostly are dalits uh, dalit worker even the one uh, uh, my own experience nearby our village uh, even tea shop uh, tea shop person small tea shop they have in the village rural only one person, the family, they're making tea and vada, something uh, they're selling in the village level. The person is recruiting their own village, their own village. Uh, they're uh, sending to the factory, sending to the factory. During that time, we had interaction with the person. He said, oh, I am uh, able to provide some employment opportunity for rural Dalit communities, Dalit communities. So, you see, they, that is not intention. They each worker, they, if they're recruiting, the, he can get uh, 5,000, 6,000 something, something rupees. Uh, so that's why the mostly they're Dalit worker from uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Tamil Nadu nearby district, even even same uh, destination district, Dalits are coming. Even uh, interstate migrant from Odisha, Jharkhand, Bihar, West Bengal, they are also recruiting, recruiting uh, by this agent, factory, uh, even nowadays government also recruiting in the name of skill training centers, skill India. The government nowadays, they promise to uh, public uh, near two crore people. They're getting young, young people getting uh, uh, employment job in skilled uh, skill uh, areas. Uh, so therefore, they are recruiting uh, in even Odisha, for example. Uh, they are providing three months training, ninety days training. After ninety days, they directly placement happening in Tirupur region, Erode, Tirupur, Coimbatore, Namakkal, Dindigul districts. Uh, it is easy. Who is coming from uh, Odisha here uh, in Tamil Nadu? They are Dalits, even uh, if they have land, if they have something for the livelihood, why should coming from from uh, from Odisha to Ta Tamil Nadu? So it is need not to come here. If they have uh, all those, uh, all the livelihood opportunity, they can survive it there only. Why here coming? They they have the, they don't, don't have a work, even though don't, don't enough um, a salary and other things is not available there. Therefore, they coming. In the category, caste category, who is uh, low category? in the name of Dalits only. So therefore, obviously nowadays even migration, this district migration, mostly are Dalits are coming and tribal. Jharkhand, who is coming? It's a tribal community, they are coming from the Jharkhand. Jharkhand. So there are obviously this most workforce in textile supply chain are uh, Dalits. Even recently one of the novel came in Tamil Nadu. The story of novel, it is researched by, written by one advocate, Murugavel. Murugavel is a um, uh, a uh, very good person. He written the novel. That's the novel very clearly said history of textile industry, how uh, shift change from agricultural to textile industry. Uh, nowadays, who is uh, who are all working in the textile industry? Which community majority they are working? How they are exploiting means exploiting happening? Uh, obviously, Dalits only. In, uh, wherever things only mostly Dalits. In process, you need the inside the mail. Most of the workers are from the outside of the local area, and 50% uh, are the skilled. They may have some professional degree, some occupational degree. They are working there, 
and there are the three type of the workers there some of the officials like the, they did the, some vocational training maybe the engineer maybe the manager managers maybe the iit who have some iti who have some technical knowledge also and the, all the contract workers who are working in the sugarcane process unit they are also some 50% are from the local area surrounding the villages and 50% are the migrants and sometimes migrants also brought by the contractor so one contractor used to bring um, maybe the um, 30 to 50 percent of the requ local requirement for the three months for the four months because it started in october every year around 20 october sugar mill started the processing and it uh, closed in may so from october to, to may or october to april they are working there seasonally and again after the may they have to go to their native places or doing some other work in this video, we took a deeper look at employment relations in the supply chains for garments and sugar. These supply chains include the agricultural production of cotton and sugarcane respectively. We learned how there is great imbalance in power between the people who own the land and the workers that they employ. This imbalance is the result of the vulnerabilities of the workers in relation to their age, gender, caste and history of migration. Work in these farms is seasonal and informal, a term that describes employment relationships without a contract. Agricultural workers are not organized into unions and are only protected by the most basic labor laws. Higher up the value chain, we can observe vast networks of garment and yarn manufacturers in the supply chains for garments and sugar processing firms in the supply chains for sugar. They are of completely different sizes and as part of these supply chains often perform completely different functions. Suppliers that can offer the lowest costs and can respond the quickest to uncertain demand are rewarded. These low costs and quick responses are often the result of poor terms of employment and compliance with labor standards. Workers are often employed under non-standard conditions and just like in agriculture, some workers are particularly vulnerable because of their age, gender, caste, and history of migration. Supply chains benefit from these vulnerabilities and from these non-standard terms of employment. They are able to reduce costs and to respond quicker to changes in demand. In the next video, we will examine the several aspects of work and employment and explore some of the persistent challenges to decent work in these globalized supply chains. Thank you for watching.